Testament lesson today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so did he, he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is God's word for us. Thanks be to God. with you today. We just heard Pastor Lynn read a passage from the Old Testament book of Isaiah about how Jesus would give up his life for us so that we could be right with God. And Pastor Barry is going to share a story with us about a man who owed a lot, a lot, a lot of money to the king. And the king asked for it back and the man said, oh no, I can't, I can't pay that money today. And the king said, Mm, okay, you don't have to pay it today. In fact, you know what? You don't have to pay it at all. I forgive the whole debt. Well, the man was shocked and amazed and so grateful. So he left and he went out into the street and he met a friend, a friend who owned him, owed him a little bit of money. And he said to his friend, I need that money today. I need it right now. And the friend said, oh, I can't give it to you right now. Well, what do you think happened? Did the man who had gotten that great big forgiveness forgive his friend? No, he didn't. He wanted that money. When the king heard about it, he was so angry. Jesus told this story to remind us that God is always forgiving us, always. And God does that so that we can remember to forgive others. Forgiveness is an awfully important gift for us to give to others. It is a healing gift. So I hope that you will remember that God is always forgiving you so that you can forgive others. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus and for his big sacrifice so that we might always be right with God. Thank you for God's forgiveness. Help us to remember that because God is always forgiving us, we should be forgiving others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, friends.
Our gospel lesson for the sermon today is taken from Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who has wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and, and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that it When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they... Then his fellow slave fell down and, and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? Anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, there is no question. God's love is unconditional. God created the universe and all of humanity and therefore loves us as a part of this good creation. No conditions on that love means there's nothing that we have to do or not do to earn it. Nothing changes God's love. God loves us always. Although God loves everyone, God does not bless everyone all of the time. Blessing is conditional. Sometimes we're blessed, sometimes we're not. We know that. So love is unconditional. Blessing is conditional. What about forgiveness? Is God's forgiveness unconditional or conditional? In other words, is forgiveness automatically given by God, or do we have to do something to receive it? We know that Christ lived, died on Calvary's cross, was resurrected, and ascended to heaven for the sake of humanity to save us from sin and eternally reunite us with God. You and I didn't do anything to earn that. 
it's free for us, but quite costly to Jesus, and it cost him his life. Our lesson from Isaiah that Pastor Lynn read expresses how much suffering he endured for our forgiveness. Forgiveness given to all of us unconditionally. Now, if there's anything we must do, it's believe and accept that grace and forgiveness. Through faith, it's ours. But once we have that forgiveness, is it ours forever? Does forgiveness remain with us unconditionally? Hmm. These are big questions. When I read Jesus' words in the Bible, I see condition. God forgives everyone's sin, all right, but forgiving sin from then on depends on our forgiving others. That's what's at issue. In the Lord's Prayer, which we recite every week and hopefully more often in our homes, Jesus says, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The word as implies a condition. But if there's any question, Jesus clarifies what he said in those verses two verses later by declaring, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Those two ifs are conditions. Reading other gospel writers, like Luke, the message from Jesus is the same. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Consistent. Then, I read today's parable from Matthew 18. And I'm even more convinced. Forgiveness is initially given without condition. But remaining in that forgiven state has a condition, one big condition, our forgiving others. But not everyone agrees with that. So before we get into Matthew 18's gospel lesson, I need to say something. John Wesley did not want his preachers to engage in foolhardy speculation while preaching. Our preaching is to reflect orthodoxy, not some edgy, trendy, avant-garde theology. And I generally fall in line with that expectation from Father John. Today, however, I'm going to roam a bit off the farm, as they say. Hear me out. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have not read every Bible scholar who's weighed in on today's subject across 2,000 years. But the ones I most regularly rely on and respect reject what Jesus plainly stated. These Bible scholars, theologians, and, and preachers explain away what seems so straightforward to me. In other words, they say that retaining our forgiveness does not depend on forgiving others who've wronged us. My scholar friends and preacher colleagues disagree with what Jesus said. Well, that poses a dilemma for me. So uh, I consulted other authorities psychologists and medical doctors who specialize in the study of forgiveness and health. Our Christian sisters and brothers who've written on this subject. And most notably, victims of horrendous crimes and atrocities, from the Holocaust to the Amish Nickel Mines school massacre right down the road here in Lancaster County. From the severest cases of abuse to the murder of one's child. And when I listen to all of these voices, especially the voices of the victims, they uniformly disagree with the religious establishment's interpretation and do agree with Jesus' 
plain talk. Hmm. So God reaches out to us to forgive sin. But after that initial act of grace, forgiving sins is conditional. Continuing to be forgiven depends upon us extending forgiveness when we're wrong and wounded. So let's get into this parable. The entire chapter of Matthew 18, and I would encourage you to read it, it's not that long. The entire chapter is about forgiveness and heaven. Much in those verses trouble us, especially the parable that's contained there. Now, parables, by definition, are supposed to put us off balance, evoke a degree of consternation, and provoke feelings of uncertainty. Despite our best efforts, then, they defy a sole, single, solitary, solid interpretation. Kind of what makes these parables so unnerving. It's also what makes them so wonderful. Jesus here uses a story based in earthly reality to illustrate a kingdom reality. And really, that's what a parable is, a tale about God's realm that uses our world to illustrate. Well, today's parable is about Gentiles, non-Jews. But interestingly, Jesus' first hearers of this parable are Jews. And Matthew's first readers are Jews who become Christian. This parable, like many of them, contains lots of exaggeration, hyperbole. For example, that amount of money owed by the first servant is 150,000 years worth of wages. No kidding. It's bigger than the national debt. I mean, no, no individual could ever owe that much, and certainly no thinking king would allow a loan to get that out of hand. Plus, the king's plan to garnish the, the family, the wife and the kids, and all of the possessions, that was actually illegal, according to Jewish law. But even if the king could sell the family, the sale would never have brought in the huge amount owed. So what happens? The king forgives the debt. Good call. Afterwards then, why does this servant who was just forgiven feel a need to the collect on the debts owed him? And why collect from this particular peer whose indebtedness is half a million times less than the earlier amount owed to the king. Now, if the first servant needed these paltry funds to, to pay off the king, uh, I guess that's fine, but, but that's not the case. He's freed from repaying everything. We know that. He doesn't need the money, yet he demands it anyway. And then when his fellow servant can't pony up the cash, he consigns him to debtor's prison. How mean, how ungrateful for his own forgiven debt. Didn't he learn anything? Didn't he learn anything? Now, I witness, eyewitnesses to this exchange between the, the servants are appalled. And so they go tattle to the king, who recalls the wicked slave, and sends him off to be tortured until the debt is repaid in full. A repayment that we just earlier noted is an impossibility. Now, if torture is going to get the king's money, then maybe it makes some perverse sense to engage in this kind of an assault. But without the ability to ever pay, such a vast amount, torture is just sociopathic. It's totally unnecessary. Finally, as hearers of this parable, you and I may be glad for justice being meted out upon this ungrateful servant. But is it really just? We closely examine the parable 
It's terrible. If the king is a stand-in for God, does he really extend forgiveness unconditionally only to take it back? So there must be a condition, albeit a hidden one. And even if we do like the fact that the first servant gets his comeuppance, the king comes off as a fickle, unjust tyrant. Is that the God we love? Imagine if this were one of us, if we were, if we were that servant. Maybe it is one of us. Did you ever think of that? Jesus tells this parable for a reason. It is obviously communicating something of vast importance, something essential. If we take him at his word, continuing to be forgiven is conditional. What's that condition? Well, it's based on our forgiving. So what do we do? Forgive. It's simple. We forgive. Now, forgiveness is extraordinarily difficult some days. We know that. This lesson and the lessons in the weeks ahead will not alter that reality and make forgiving any easy. In the meantime, though, One's ability to forgive, like every ability we have, is a gift from God. You cannot forgive. I understand. More importantly, God understands. Sometimes it takes time. If you recognize, however, how important it is to forgive and possess even the slightest willingness to extend that forgiveness, then please rely on God to endow you with the ability to forgive. Some tasks are too big for us, but they're not too big for God. Pray for Christ's spirit, that forgiving spirit, to help you forgive. And if you're still wondering, well, again, why, why must we forgive? Because we who receive Christ's love and profess our love for him are to imitate to be Christ-like. He forgives, we forgive. We don't take that forgiveness for granted, but express our thankfulness by forgiving whenever we forgive. What Christ does for us, we do for others. We don't want God's forgiveness to be diminished for ourselves or, or, or for others. We want God's mercy to expand. We expand. Forgive. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.